Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall, whom I'm trying to beat in a game of Pong. Pong is the granddaddy of all computer games, and that's the subject of our program today, computer games. And Gary, computer games, in fact, were important, weren't they, in getting the whole personal computer thing going? Well, they certainly were a part of it. Uh, one of the unique aspects of a personal computer is that it often has uh, bitmap color graphics, like the Apple II, for example. And that way you can do very dynamic things, games that you couldn't do, say, with a teletype style or scrolling uh, display we'd find in a larger computer system. This particular game, obviously, is a pretty old vintage, and, and uh, they've gotten a lot more sophisticated since then, and we're going to see some of that today. Indeed, we've got a very exciting show. We'll be meeting some of the superstars of computer game programming from Electronic Arts, from Atari, and from Activision. And while the idea of computers in games may be new, the idea of people playing games with machines is not really new. Now, that, was, me. Got, that, was, that was the first one. That was right. legitimate. Before the first program was written to simulate a starry background or a speeding racer, Penny Arcades offered simpler, more mechanical amusements, but with the same goals in mind, to challenge and entertain. If the locale was less exotic and the competition less ferocious, at least some of the game's interactions were similar. A player needed manual dexterity in competing for points or a reward more tangible in some cases than in others. As a device for escaping daily routine, computer-generated graphics brought a level of fantasy that no mechanical game could ever approach. Instead of escaping from a schoolroom or an office, a player could leave the Earth or move to a different universe. Modern arcade computer games offer different kinds of challenges, from fast action games that demand even faster reactions to maze-type games where the player threads his way around obstacles and war games, where the object is to destroy or be destroyed. In one of the latest adventure games, animated images are stored on laser disc to be recalled sequentially, following the story's plot and according to the player's responses. If the player moves the control stick in the right direction, he is rewarded with a successful escape. But if the player makes a mistake, the program picks an alternative sequence of images, and the results can be extremely uncomfortable. Whether used to create unknown worlds or to enhance the reality of familiar worlds, computer games succeed in an unlikely domain, transforming pinpoints of light on a little screen into a believable realm, larger than life and usually more exciting. studio are Steve Kitchen, designer of an incredible new game, Space Shuttle, from Activision, and Chris Crawford, one of the top game designers with Atari. Gary? Steve and Chris, uh, you're both, you both build computer-based games. Uh, do you call yourselves designers or programmers? I call myself a designer because most of the sweat and blood I expend occurs in the design phase, not in the programming phase. I spend a great deal of time worrying about what my audience will experience in the game, and only towards the end of the project do I actually get down to writing any code. And when you think about the design of the game, what are the elements of the game that make, make it interesting? Well, that has to do a great deal with what I'm trying to accomplish. I set a goal. I want a game to achieve a certain effect. I want to somehow communicate a message to my audience. That message then dictates the topic and the style of the game, the nature of the graphics, the feel. That's what mm -hmm. the texture of the game that I'm trying to build into it. That's what I uh, spend most of my time mm -hmm. worrying about. Chris, you're talking more like a writer rather than a computer programmer. Steve, is that how you see what you do? That's basically what we are. We're writers. We're writing a book, a novel, creating a vicarious universe in this computer program. Uh, we have to model everything we want, put every small detail in. Uh, very often, in my game, for instance, I had to do extensive research for a year and a half to understand my subject before I could distill the important aspects out and then put them into this cartridge. Like a writer would. Exactly like a writer would. When a writer writes a book, the book is a vicarious universe. You read it and become part of it. It's the same thing. When you play these games, these programs, uh, you vicariously become part of the universe that the, the programmer puts into it. 
Okay, you've got Space Shuttle up here, and uh, give us a demonstration of how this works. Well, this is an automatic demo flight we're going to fly. Uh, this is a complete Space Shuttle mission from launch to landing. This is actually themed after the STS-2 flight back in November of 1981. We're starting off now at Cape Kennedy in the morning. The clouds are rolling by, the sun is coming up, and we're doing our countdown now. Now at T minus four seconds, we're gonna turn our main engines on. You're gonna see the thrust indicators at the top of the screen there moving along. There we go. At T plus three seconds, the solid rocket boosters are gonna turn on and we're gonna go through the clouds and off the pad. And there we go. Now, the aspect of the game here is to fly the space shuttle successfully into a 210 nautical mile orbit, doing all the control functions that an astronaut would really do, setting your yaw and your pitch, keeping on a trajectory line. Uh, at 26.2 nautical miles, the solid rocket boosters will jettison off. Now, this is a very important point of accuracy, is there's a yellow flash. There we go. Uh, this is something that wasn't noted until STS-1, when the first astronauts went up, that this actually happened. I had to find all of these details out about what you would experience if you were inside of the space shuttle and you were doing the flying so that when you play this game, you feel like you've actually flown. Steve, it seems to me the incredible thing is this game is running on an Atari 2600, not a computer. How do you squeeze all of this into that unit? Well, it takes a lot of time programming, coding. Um, you have to model the universe as you feel it should really be, and then you have to find how you can fit it all in piece by piece. You start off with a basic mission and then you add features and you add the functions all along the way. When I finished the game, I was not happy with it, and I had an additional list of 146 separate items I wanted to put in that I still felt were important. Uh, I, I spent an additional three months finishing those off and getting them all in. I wanted this to be absolutely accurate and absolutely complete, and no, it you is. You put this all inside of a, how big a ROM? It's so an 8K cartridge. 8K cartridge. <laughs> That's an incredible amount of... Uh... It took 13 months of programming, and a lot of that time <laughs> was spent putting it all together. Now, we've just achieved orbit. There's the Earth's room rolling underneath. The external tank will jettison. There it goes. And we've docked with an orbiting satellite, which actually was themed after the Skylab. In fact, Dr. Ed Gibson did a review on the game, and he noted that it looked like you were trying to, to fly into his old, uh, his old nemesis in space. Uh, and then we do our deorbit, and we come in for a landing at Edwards Air Force Base. Now, you're, one thing unique you did in adapting this game to the 2600 is using the switches in the, in, in the 2600 as, as functional switches. How did you do that? And what we had to do was, was I had to throw out all the old ideas of what this machine would do. Uh, this was originally a video game console, so I said, look, all these switches are controlled by the computer. I'm going to redefine them to be computer switches. I'm going to control the main engines, the backup engines, the cargo bay doors, the landing gear, the sequence of information on the screen. It became so different that we had to develop an overlay to fit over the, the screen. We had to develop a what's called a cheat sheet, which is just what the astronauts use. This gives you all the instructions that are necessary to fly your shuttle. And the instruction book is 30 pages long. And it gives you a lot of detail into exactly how to fly the space shuttle. And basically, it's a small flight manual. We provide a glossary. We provide drawings of the space shuttle, uh, engine indicators. Um, here's a side view of the space shuttle that we provide. So really, you understand all about the space shuttle in order to fly this game accurately. You get a little pilot's license when you get through this? <laughs> uh, if you fly successfully, you receive a patch. And if you fly just as an astronaut would, you might get your wings. Uh, we're entering Earth's atmosphere now, and you see we're getting the uh, ionization cone that appears around the space shuttle. If you saw the movie The Right Stuff, you would see in the sequence with John Glenn. This is what the astronauts see in the window. This is hot ionized gas being superheated by the friction of the, the shuttle on the way in. We've even lost our signals. We've lost our altitude and speed information, and we've lost our computer screens. Steve, it seems uh, piloting the space shuttle is very difficult to do, one would think. Can a, a, a kid or a normal person actually pull this off? Well, what I did when I designed this was I, I understood that problem. Uh, having the average individual fly the space shuttle would take years of work. But I looked at how NASA trains its astronauts, and they start off, first of all, by giving them a, a lot of book exercises. They give them film strips of what it's like to fly the space shuttle. This is flight number one. You're seeing, essentially, a film strip. You can pick up the joystick and take control at any time you want to, but you don't have to. There's a second flight called a training flight, and that basically is like flying in a simulator. You can make mistakes, you can make errors, and the computer will compensate, and it will let you know. Mm -hmm. And then flight three is the actual real thing. So you work your way up to flying the actual mission. You can get into it very easily, and then work your way up and finally try to achieve your wings. The interesting thing about this game, I think, uh, is that it's, it is a, it's an educational learning experience as well as... Uh, Vicariously educational. Right. You're not sitting there playing flashcards. Mm -hmm. you're, you're learning about one of the most technologically advanced items today. 
oh, there are the dual sonic booms that occur. The first one was the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. The second one was the chase planes. And we're, we're coming in now at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, when you get done mastering this game, you've effectively learned all about what an astronaut does when he's in orbit. So the next time you see a launch go off, you're going to know what he has to do, when he has to do it, and what he goes through. It's incredible. Uh, we need another minute or so before we land here. While we're waiting, Chris, uh, let's talk about you have your new game is called Excalibur. What what is that about? Excalibur is a game of leadership. The concept I wanted to uh, express to people the ideas behind von Clausewitz's statement: "War is the extension of policy to other means." That is, I was a little tired of war games that glorify war. So I wanted to show that, that war is something that sometimes cannot be avoided, but must never be uh, entered into in a cavalier manner. And so really, I was trying to teach concepts of leadership. And so in the game Excalibur, I, uh, uh, I make you as King Arthur. I give you the task of unifying Britain. Now, unification is entirely different from conquest. That is, you have to convince people of your authority. You have to convince them to follow you. And that involves more than merely brute force. Chris, we have a little bit of time left. Can you get Excalibur up on the screen and show us yeah. just a piece of that? This is the title scene to Excalibur. And it uh, does nothing more than give the title and set a tone and show off who did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was designed to run on the Atari 800 or... Yes, the, uh, uh, I've cut it off. Uh, this was designed for the 800 with 48K and a disk drive. It's a huge game. It actually won't fit on the 800. It requires disk swapping. And so you, uh, you bring in whole chunks of game at a time. It's, uh, it's actually 66K of object code. Very, very large game, all written in assembly language. Okay, well, if you've played Raster Blaster or messed around with Pinball Construction Set, you've been manipulated by the mind of Bill Budge, one of the premier game designers. We'll meet Bill and the president of Electronic Arts in just a moment. Joining us now is game designer Bill Budge, who works with Electronic Arts, and the president of Electronic Arts, Trip Hawkins. Bill, uh, there's quite an array of uh, games out here on the table. And what is it that makes a, a game successful, or what kind of factors go into the design of a game? Uh, it's really hard to, um, you can't ask people what they want to see on the computer and what kind of programs they want. I really think that a person writing a program has to have an inner conviction of something uh, and write a program that they want to write and a program that they want to use. Uh, when I started writing this program, it was something I really wanted to do. I wanted to see it work. And Where'd I, you get the idea for it? Um, so, I always liked building things, and it was a funny, interact kind of process. I got tired of writing video games. I was really sick of playing them by this time. And I thought, well, it's fun to, to make video games. I still kind of like to write them, and I bet other people would really like to write them. You're talking about the pinball construction set. Right. And uh, this is kind of a nice game because it actually involves you in the construction of the game itself. It's kind of like a metagame. Yeah. Is the success of that been pretty good in, in the sense that is there a special segment that you're selling to as far as the construction well, set? Well, when you start out, yeah, you're looking uh, to the really avant-garde computer mm -hmm. users. It takes a while for the message to get out there when everyone is still discovering Pac-Man and a program comes along that's telling them they can build video games. Well, it doesn't register at first. But it's got a slow growth that builds up, and, and finally now we're getting you know, very good results. The game kind of craze dies out. This stuff's taken off. Mm -hmm. Trip, on, on the business side, what do you look for for a successful software game? Well, I think Pinball Construction Set has a lot of the things that you look for, and that's why it's, it's now one of the top ten sellers in the country, according to Billboard magazine. Uh, we have a philosophy of having products that are simple, hot, and deep. <clears throat> simple so that you don't have to read a lot of instructions. Of course, most people don't want to have to learn how to operate the computer. They want to just uh, do things with it right away. And Pinball Construction Set, you can immediately play one of the pinball games that are included, or you can quickly make up one of your own, and it's very simple to do that, as I think Bill will illustrate. Uh, we also like to have products that are hot, uh, in that they should fully use the sound and graphics and other capabilities of the machine. And we also look for programs that are deep. In the case of Pinball Construction Set, uh, you can make your own pinball game. So it has a lot of create, creative uh, possibilities and allows people to control what they're going to make and interact with it and change it. And that's one of the things that extends 
the uh, life of the product and causes people to come back to it again and again. It's kind of fun to take a look at this. I'm it? dying. I'm <laughs> dying to say. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Well, you know, it, this is a, a very simple sort of real-world idea. It's a construction set. You have uh, something that you're building on this side of the screen and a set of parts over here. And I have a hand here that I control with the joystick, and I use that to move things around, say, on the board, the game I'm building. I can modify this game. And uh, I can get parts out of the box, and I can just add them over. So they're kind of bumpers here. you're putting into your game. I'm here. just putting bumpers, yeah. This is a, a favorite of really young kids. They like to just grab a whole bunch of bumpers, fill the board up with them, and put a ball on there. A pinball aficionado would, would gasp, but little kids don't really build pinball machines. They just sort of build things with this. And I can get a ball and put that over here. Then if I want to try out the game, I can just push this uh, menu selection right here, and the game starts to play. And now you can see I've got two balls, one up there. I can launch this one. And I can go out and play the game a little bit, and the balls drop down at the, at the bottom eventually. Uh, but before I let that happen, I'll just go back to the parts box and start editing again, get rid of some of these. Bill, this was kind of a, a new level, I suppose, of, of computer game where you really can design the game yourself. What, what, if you can tell us, what are you working on now? What would be the next step in computer games? Um, I want to extend the idea of a construction set. I think this, is, uh, this one was hard to do when I started and, uh, because there are lots of combinations and things you can't really predict when you're making a kit to make a meta game, as you said. Um, I'd like to extend the idea even further, and the problem there is then designing the parts box. In pinball, it's a small set of parts. You don't really have to worry about... Um, thinking up abstractions um, and a general um, construction set, it's not clear what the parts should be. It's almost like you're inventing a new language for representing um, specifications for programs. It gets a very difficult computer science um, problems. Trip, uh, at the arcade level, we hear that maybe you know games sort of peaked and people aren't quite as interested. Are computer games uh, here to stay, or is it a fad? I think computer games are fundamentally different from video games, mainly because computer technology in the home can be extended and become a much broader uh, base of technology. Uh, just as an example, all of these programs that we're talking about here, uh, they come on floppy disks, and each one of these holds much more memory than can be held in the memory of a coin-operated arcade game. And it really is, it, it becomes a, uh, a question of the program size when you finally want to know how good a program can I have and how much can I do with it and how long will it take before I'm bored with it or I've exhausted the educational value. And I can get, uh, oh, something like three or four times more program on here than I can fit into the memory of a, of a coin-operated game. Okay, you've got, you've got one on one there. Maybe we can get it loaded. Well, I think, Gary, you had a question. Well, the only thing I was going to mention is it seems like the games have gone from relatively unsophisticated games to something that requires a lot of sophistication in terms of programming, and, and uh, the memory size is really an important thing, important aspect mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, it's hard to really so. put that back into 8K. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has that been the difference, really, in the, you know, the early computer games, you know, pretty limited now, the incredible graphics and speed? Has it really been a function of the available memory? Uh, part of it is just programmers getting uh, better, I think. Uh, not many people wrote video games five years ago. There was a mm -hmm. small selection. Now there are thousands of people who are capable of writing a good video game. And uh, a few people have upped the ante, so it's not enough maybe to write a video game. You have to write a video game plus a game editor. I think the more popular games really have the, these extra features built in. Can we get one-on-one -on -one in there? That's a kind of exciting uh, demonstration of what you can do. And I think, uh, Tripp, you're going to take on either Dr. J or Larry Bird here. Is mm -hmm. that Tell us about one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, well, the basic idea of one-on-one -on -one was to get these two guys, uh, Julie Serving and Larry Bird, who are the, uh, the, probably the two best-known basketball players and probably the two best forwards that have ever played the game, and uh, to capture their personalities in the game. And so we decided to hire them to help us design the game, and we had photo sessions where we took pictures of them in action. In fact, we had a camera mounted at mid-court just exactly from this angle while we photographed them. And then we worked with them on prototypes of the product where we'd sit down and talk to them about the moves that they would use and the, some of the strategies and the shooting percentages that they would have in different places on the court. And that was a fascinating learning experience. But you uh, say programmed in the personality. I mean, these characters play like Larry Bird. Would very much so. In fact, why don't I go ahead and get go started? Ahead, yeah. Right now they're playing against one another in a demonstration game, but I, if I press the button on my joystick, it'll take me to a menu, and I can quickly make a selection. I, I want to play against the computer. I'm going to allow the computer to play Larry Bird and I'm going to play at the uh, varsity level. There are different levels uh, depending on how good a player I am. And now I go ahead and start the game. And uh, that's uh, Larry Bird taking an outside shot and he hit it. Now Bird is particularly effective at outside shots. But watch Julius now. I'm going to be able to uh, drive around him, I hope. 
clips and stole okay, the ball. Okay, now, now you're Larry Bird now. No, I'm J Dr. J. You're Dr. J. And, and the computer's the ball. Larry. Okay. He's trying to work his way into the basket. <clears throat> so he's got a quick four nothing lead over me. Uh oh, and now I have to have the indignation of seeing it on an instant replay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, where do you think, uh, Trip, the software games are going to next? I mean, what's the next generation of this kind of stuff? I, I, I hate to interrupt you. I'm trying to, trying to get back on. Well, I had to had to have a slam dunk there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, what's happening next? I mean, what's the next tier, the next level of, of computer well, games? Well, at a really simplistic level, it's very, level easy down, to, uh, it's very easy to extend the uh, realism and the graphics that are in the current products. And I think it's also, uh, you're, you're going to increasingly see more creative possibilities for the player, which is, which is, I think, where a lot of the educational value comes from. Uh, being able to create your own pinball game is one example. We've extended that with Music Construction Set to a product that, uh, is about music, and of course there are a lot of people that are really interested in music and interested in having their children learn about music, and it uses a lot of the ideas that Bill pioneered with the pinball construction set. And I think that the, uh, the area where the greatest challenges will come in is, is in looking for original ideas and new creative ways to break the mold. I mean, a lot of people uh, look at what other people have done and try to do something that's a spin-off from that, but the, the really creative geniuses in the industry are capable of coming up with something completely new. Do they just come to you, they, they say, we've got an idea and here's a, here's a program I've written and then you turn around and sell it? It, 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 happen, happen? it happens all different ways. We have one of our better products, it's called Hard Hat Mac, and two high school boys came into our office one day and they had three sheets of high school notebook paper they'd drawn up in their physics class and we signed a contract based on that. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Bill, Tripp, thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine. In the Random Access file, Hewlett Packard has made another major move into the personal computer field with a new portable printer designed for the PC market. It is a non-impact inkjet printer with low noise operation, battery powered, 150 characters per second, and an 11 by 12 character matrix. The price is under $500 and it will be available next month. IBM in the news again this week. First of all, IBM announced a licensing agreement with Intel to allow IBM to produce its own 8088 chips, the microprocessor used in the PC. Tremendous demand on Intel's output of the 8088 has kept IBM from producing enough PCs to meet its demand. Perhaps more important, though, is the fact that Intel apparently also gave IBM the right to make its own 8286 chips, a much more advanced microprocessor, which analysts believe IBM will use in its new personal computer, codenamed Popcorn. With the ability to turn out the chips, it is thought that IBM may now be able to introduce the popcorn this summer. The use of the advanced microprocessor will enable popcorn to do sophisticated graphics and other complex integrated functions. Sounds like popcorn may take on the Macintosh Lisa crowd. Victor Technologies, the high-flying hardware computer company which took a nosedive this year, may be bought out by the British firm Applied Computer Technologies. The would-be buyer indicated it might close down the Silicon Valley factory and move operations to Scotland. 
Also on the ailing list, Tandon Corporation, the nation's largest maker of disk drives, says it will lay off about 1,000 employees and transfer most of its manufacturing overseas to cut production costs. In fact, countries all over the world are dropping in on the Silicon Valley trying to get a piece of the high-tech action. In the last year, 20 different countries have sent delegations to the Silicon Valley in an effort to lure their business abroad. The countries offer incentives such as government subsidies and attractive tax packages. The most successful recruiter by far has been Ireland. One foreign country very much on the mind of high-tech executives is Japan, with particular attention focused now on the debate in the Japanese parliament on a new proposed software bill which would limit software copyright protection for U.S. products to 15 years and force American companies to allow Japanese firms to sell U.S.-made software. The net result would be little protection for American manufacturers, with Japanese companies able to sell the same software at a lower price by avoiding the high research and development cost. And speaking of software, you say you have a modem but can't use all the bells and whistles because you don't have the right communication software? Listen to Paul Schindler. Okay, it's all set. Three men in a monkey suit. Uh, listen, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you later. Bye-bye. Communications. Did you know that using one of these devices, called modems, computers can talk on the phone, just like us, only faster, but if you already have PC communications, you might be surprised to hear that you are in a minority. Fewer than one-fourth of PCs communicate. So many of you are waiting to make the plunge. Perhaps the hundreds of communications packages on the market have daunted you. Well, the Whole Earth Software Catalog and Review has sorted communications out for beginners. Now, if your computer runs the CPM operating system, we suggest you consider MITE or Modem 7. For users of the IBM PC, the best packages are SmartCom 2 and Crosstalk 16. PC Talk 3 is more limited, but then at $35, it's also the cheapest communications package. Apple computer users may want TSC Terminal if they use 40 column screens, or Data Capture 2 for 80 columns. Commodore and Radio Shack users will find CompuServe's Vidtex a best buy. Now, there simply isn't time to get into all the wonderful things you can do once you have communications, but believe me, a PC on the phone opens up new worlds. Just ask someone who already has a modem. Call them, or call their computer. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Next week, Paul takes a look at Ken Houston's professional blackjack program. Well, the hot software this month, tax preparation programs. Two of the more than 20 tax packages have hit the software top 10 this week. The two best sellers are Tax Advantage from Continental Software. It sells for about $70. And Tax Prepare from Howard Soft. It's a bit more complex and sells for $250. And as if you hadn't noticed, there are still more computer magazines coming out on the market. The latest count shows more than 300 computer periodicals. The fastest growing ones are Compute, personal computing, popular computing, and info world. Finally, the last place you want to see a computer, let alone a robot, is in your neighborhood bar. Yet it seems the sweep of technology has no limits. In San Francisco this week, the world's first robot bartender was unveiled. The robot can talk, can take spoken orders, and can mix 200 different drinks. But on the first test run, when the waitress yelled out, give me a Bloody Mary and a beer, the robot knocked a glass off the bar and onto the floor and poured beer all over the counter. The robot's designer said there were still some bugs to be worked out. Kind of makes a human feel good. That's it for this week's Random Access File. I'm Stuart Chaffee. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine.